Greetings to you from the chapel of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Bering Springs, Michigan. It is my privilege today to talk to you about the Trinity and its implications for personal salvation through Christ mediated to us by the Holy Spirit and what implications that might also have for our understanding of the role and the purpose of the body of Christ, the church, in its life, its mission, and how we might live together with one another. What we're dealing with here is the so what of the Trinity. Most of the previous lectures have dealt with either the what or the how of the doctrine of the Trinity. By what I mean, what do we actually mean when we speak of Trinitarian doctrine? The how refers to how the church historically, through reflection on scripture, through its personal experience, its collective experience, came to understand God as a Trinitarian being, as a Trinitarian God. Now, as we begin this, what we need to remind ourselves of is this, that if the Trinity is only an argument about abstract theological ideas, we probably don't have the time for this conversation. But I would like to suggest that the implications or the so what of the Trinity is absolutely foundational to our understanding as to who God is, what we mean by God as saving us in Jesus Christ through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what it really means to live together, to serve together, and to witness for God as the body of Christ, the church. Let's just briefly review the key components of Trinitarian confession of faith. First of all, we believe that there is a Godhead composed of the Eternal Father, the Eternal Son, and the Eternal Holy Spirit. This has never been confessed classically as three gods. This is three divine persons that make up one Trinitarian Godhead. These three divine persons are one in nature, one in character, and one in purpose. Now, when we say that they are one in purpose, what we really mean here is that God created us in love, and this was an agreement that the Trinity had in the great Council of Peace, but also the Trinity because the Trinity has foreknown the future, understood that there would be a great fall called the fall into sin. And so there was a terrific council of peace in which the purposes of God between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit determined what they would do to meet the sin emergency. Now, this sin emergency became a great revelation of God's divine redeeming power. And the real mystery that lies here, that we don't know all the background, but we know what the conclusions were, is that the Father took the position or was acknowledged by the Trinity in a unanimous agreement that the Father would be the overall chief administrator of the great creation and salvation plan. And then it was decided that Jesus Christ would voluntarily, and maybe he just stepped forward. Like I say, we don't know all the ins and outs as to what happened in this great council of peace. But anyhow, the son voluntarily submitted himself to the Father. There was no diminution of his power and authority, but he took a new position to be the active agent in making the atonement and being the chief active agent in creation and, of course, redemption. 
the Holy Spirit took a subordinate position to both the Father and the Son while he did not sacrifice one bit of his divine being or nature. And his great sacrifice was to submit himself so to the bidding of the Father and the service and the glorification of the Son is that he would totally lose his own personal identity except for occasional manifestations under symbols such as doves, fire, water, etc. So what we have here is three divine persons who have decided to create and Jesus is designated as the active agent in creation and he is designated as the active agent as they anticipated in their omniscience, in their foreknowledge, the fall of the angelic powers and the fall of man. Now, how really serious is it to be right on doctrine? I believe that it is quite important to be right on doctrine, even though technically in the final analysis, none of us will be saved by the purity of our theology. But hopefully the purity or the truthfulness of our theology will help us to have a better understanding as to who God is and what his purposes are, particularly for the human race, its creation, and then of course, how the love of God plays into redemption and what implications does this have for the church. Let me just give you one quick illustration here regarding the importance of doctrine. It's like a good background check that an employer would do on a prospective employee. You don't want people telling bad things about you if you're wanting to get a job in which your professional reputation will be on the line. So I think we can say that good doctrine is like a good background check on God. Let me give you a quick illustration. My mother, as a young person, grew up in a church where the doctrine of ever-burning eternal hell was preached, as we say down south, hot and heavy, by the holiness evangelist. And when she was a little girl, she quietly made up her mind if that was what God was like, she didn't want any part of him. And so she quietly became an atheist. She didn't kick up a big fuss about it. But later, she and her mother, after the breakup of the family, tragically enough, moved to Florida. They became acquainted with a wonderful, loving and lovable Seventh-day Adventist family. And one day, they had taken a big interest in my mother, both personally and spiritually, as they began to talk about spiritual things. My mother really shocked them when she confessed that she didn't believe in God. And so they followed up with some very sensitive questioning. Why not? And she told them about how offended she was that God was a God who would cause people, because of their sin and time, to spend an eternity in unending torment of the most indescribable nature. Well, I want to tell you, it came as good news to my mother that this godly couple named Ivan and Iva Crowder could give her a good Bible study that took away that horrible blot that had been placed on God's character. And I think that this is a very important thing, especially for Christians and more especially for Seventh-day Adventists to do because we believe that we are caught up in the throes of a great controversy between Satan and Christ over just what is the nature of the Godhead. Is God a God of love or is God some kind of God who in the creation of the world and in the redemption of human beings has his character got distorted and out of balance? In fact, the big debate in what we as Seventh-day Adventists call the great controversy thing primarily centers on the issue of the love of God. Can we really say that God is love as the scripture tells us? Again, one of the great memory verses is 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Thus, I would argue 
that the Trinitarian doctrine is absolutely foundational for Christianity and even more especially for great controversy telling Seventh-day Adventist narrative theology. Again, let's think about the primary issue here for a few moments. When we say that God is love, what we believe that the scripture reveals in its larger narrative, which includes the total scope of eternity in the past, the creation of the universe as we now know it, the rebellion of Lucifer who then becomes Satan, the fall of our foreparents, which implicates all of their subsequent children into the problem of sin, which has so distorted our views of God. What we believe is that the Holy Trinity has existed for all eternity in mutually submissive, supportive, self-sacrificing, outflowing, creative, and redemptive love. Let me run that by again. What we believe is that the great narrative of the Bible teaches that the Holy Trinity, the Eternal Father, the Eternal Son, the Eternal Holy Spirit, have always existed in a profound oneness that is held together by their shared nature of eternal, self-sacrificing, mutually submissive and supportive, but outflowing, creative and redemptive love. In other words, the very nature of God is to create so that the whole love triangle of the Trinity can be broadened to include other beings that have been created in God's social loving, if you please, image. In fact, one of the first conclusions that we can come to is that if this is the biblical truth about God, then it's important to live in love. But the problem is, is that due to sin, it's just not possible for us sinners, naturally in and of ourselves, to live in divine likeness loving ways. The sad truth of Scripture is not only is God great and is God good, but the sad truth is, is that we, though we are made in the image of God, and though we are being restored to the image of God, the facts are, is that when God comes to find us, we are very distorted, and we more naturally live for self than we do to live in a way that is God-like in a Trinitarian way. Now, let's also remember this. We've mentioned this earlier. That when we say that God is love, Satan says, no, God is not love because he has been unfair in the way he has asked us to serve him. He has been unloving. He has asked us to live in perfect obedience to his holy law. And Satan says, that's not right. And then he turns the whole thing on its head in the great controversy theme by saying, the only way to live is to live all out for self and self-gratification. The way to be happy is to eat all you can Make love all you can, gain all that you can, no matter how it affects others in your life, no matter how alienated they might become, no matter how needy they might become because we have been so busy with our own self-aggrandizement. None of that really matters. Whereas the great theme of the Bible, particularly as it comes to climactic revelation, in the life and in the work of Jesus Christ is that the way to really live is the way the Trinity has always lived for all eternity past, and that is to live to be mutually submissive to others, to be mutually supportive of others, and to live in creative, loving, and redeeming ways 
rather than selfish ways. So here we are. Here we are living in the early part of the 21st century. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe that we are living in the last days. But here we find ourselves caught up in this great tragedy and this great deceptive, destructive situation that we call sin. How can we be saved? Or maybe the question ought to be this. So who is it that can really save? What I would like to do is I need to share with you that my reflections on this subject go back a number of years to my teaching advanced theology to undergraduates right here at Andrews University. And it was through teaching them advanced Adventist theology that I was able to really think my way through the issues of the Trinity and the issue of who is it alone that can redeem. In other words, I had to try to really pull together the issues having to do with Trinity and the issues of personal salvation. Now those class lectures became embodied in a book that I and two of my seminary colleagues produced and it was published in 2002. This volume is still available. It is called The Trinity, Understanding God's Love, His Plan of Salvation and Christian Relationships. It was published by the Review and Herald and I called the other day and they told me they still have 1,700 copies of this book available, and you can have it for the bargain basement price of four to five dollars a copy. Now that's a real deal, folks, for a hard copy book. For those of you that are Latin in background, it has also been translated by the Brazilian publishing house into Portuguese, and both the South American division and the Inter-American division have translated it into Spanish. So this is readily available. And what I want to do is I want to share with you some of my thinking on why the Trinity is absolutely important for us to understand that it is only through Trinitarian love, especially as it has been manifested in the covenant-making, atonement-prosecuting, saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ as it is mediated to us through the Holy Spirit. So the question then comes to us, who is it that can save? Are we able to save ourselves and our sinfulness from our sinfulness? The sad truth is that we simply cannot. And so what the Holy Trinity has done is mounted up a great effort which we call the salvation plan. And the point man for the whole salvation plan is none other than Jesus Christ. Who is it that can redeem? Here is the great theme as to what will follow in the remaining minutes of this lecture. It is the great conviction of the Trinitarian Fathers it is the great conviction of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Trinitarian Orthodoxy since the fourth century that only God can redeem lost, sinful human beings. And the person who has been designated to take the lead in all of this has been the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who sent by the Father, empowered by the Spirit, made full provision for the salvation of the whole human race. In other words, the salvation plan that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have been involved in even before the creation of the world. From the foundation of the world, Jesus was crucified, as it were. The only being that can really save is none other than the eternal, fully divine Lord Jesus Christ working in concert with the empowerment of the Father through the mighty Holy Spirit. Now, my thinking 
became so coalesced that I'm almost afraid I will mess it up unless I just share with you what comes right out of this book. And then you can go get the book and read it over and you can argue with me or you can say amen, you can do whatever you want to do with it. The question comes, who alone can redeem? The biblical story tells us that in God's original creation, he invested humanity with the natural ability to love and live like the Trinity. But sadly, humans have rebelled and now live more like demons than they do like lovers. How then has God reacted to this tragic turn of events? The great news from our maker is that not only has he created us in an amazing act of overflowing love, that is, he wanted to widen the circle of the exercise of Trinitarian love, but he is now determined to redeem us in an awesome outpouring of self-sacrificing love. It is at the very essence of this sacrificial love where the truth of the Trinity receives its greatest acid test and its most startling and moving revelation. God has had to confront the issue of both angelic and human rebellion, a type of sin that is totally against the grain of his heart of eternal triune love. What was God to do? What is he still to do today? The compelling storyline of the Bible is that the triune God has chosen to love us in a way that creates the only possible path for reconciliation and redemption. It manifests a redemptive scenario that can restore other directed relationships with himself and in the process establish a relational orientation that will once again enable human beings to live in love with one another. I ask you, my friends, let me pause here for just a moment. Does this sound like an ambitious goal and agenda? Very ambitious. Does it sound like something you would like to experience? Let me ask you this, would you like to be a part of a church that is filled with loving and lovable people that are most of the time thinking about others rather than themselves that are trying to be forgiving, uplifting, redemptive, creative, affirmative? Is this the kind of church you'd like to be in? Then I think you ought to be in a church that is really seriously Trinitarian and is interested in being redeemed by the Trinity, transformed by the Trinity, et cetera, et cetera. The great truth is, is that while God does not love our sin and sinfulness, his very nature of love has instinctively impelled him to reach out in redemptive mercy, not to lash out in a hot flash of righteous justice. And he has done all of this in a way that intends to restore our status as his infinitely valued sons and daughters. Wow! His goal is to savingly change us into his image through the healing of our sinful histories and to change our natures that have so bedeviled his existence and ours. Once more we ask, how is God to accomplish all of this ambitious redemptive project? Is he to act with righteous force and simply say, I'm done with you people, I'm going to purge the universe of all sin and sinners, be they angelic or human? Yes, God could have done that, but he has not chosen such a quick fix. The biblical narrative strongly suggests that his way has been the path of patient, long-suffering appeals and demonstrations of his eternal love for the alienated and the lost. The heart of his plan has been sacrificially to give his own divine son to come and be one with us as a man to show us what godly love is really all about. The climax of the son's mission was to live and die in such a way that we could be forgiven, reconciled, and ultimately healed of the disease of sin. Now, the great conviction 
of this lecture is Christ alone is able to redeem. Maybe the question could be put this way, but did the sacrificial gift have to be the person of God's very own son? Could the agent of reconciliation have been an angel or some unfallen being from some other world who has always loved God and remained loyal? Such questions incited the ancient debates of the fourth century A.D., over the divine nature of Christ. Athanasius, he's known as Saint Athanasius in the history of the early church, was the major advocate for the full eternal deity of Christ. In other words, that Christ was a divine being who was co-eternal with God the Father and was co-eternal with God the Holy Spirit and that they were three co-eternal divine eternal beings. Pardon my repetition. Athanasius was the major, if you please, activist and defender of what we now call Trinitarian theology, particularly centering on the eternal deity of Christ. He took a very firm stand against Arius of Alexandria over the issue of the deity of Christ. He affirmed that the only one, I'm talking about now Athanasius, he determined, determined and affirmed that the only one who could effectively redeem and heal the world was none other than God himself in the person of his son, Christ Jesus, the incarnate God-man. No created or derived being, angelic or otherwise, was deemed able to pull off this great mission. But why is it that only the unique Son of God would be capable of such a mission? Why is Jesus the only being who could fully reveal what God is like? What follows are answers flowing from the very core of the biblically revealed Trinitarian nature of the Godhead. The first answer to this question is why it had to be a person of the Godhead and what was decided in the Holy Trinity's Great Council of Peace is that that point person would be none other than the person that we now call God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, what it shows us is that only one who is fully God can effectively show us what God is truly like. Here you can reference John 14, verses 8 to 11, and 1 Corinthians 1, 21 to 24. And since Jesus was fully one in nature and character with the Father, he could demonstrate the truth about not only himself, but God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Not only does it, quote, take one to know one, but it takes one who really knows about deity by his very nature to give a truly credible revelation of what God is like. No created God, semi-God, demigod, or God of some derived divine nature would be sufficiently equipped to do this job, especially in the face of the enormous challenges that the rebellion of Satan and our foreparents has inflicted not only on this world but the universe. Let me put it succinctly. Only a divine insider can really show humanity and the universe, the intelligent universe, the truth about God. The second major point as to why it had to be God the Son is that only God could offer a sacrifice that would be of sufficient value to be able to redeem alienated lost sinners. This deeper question swirls around the issue of why it is only a member of the Godhood, namely Jesus, could offer a fully effectual saving sacrifice for sin. Here we need to move with the utmost care and clarity. And this is one of the reasons I'm reading from my very 
classroom generated manuscript. We need to remind ourselves that we are on the borders of heavy truth shrouded in profound mystery. First of all, we need to admit that in a literal sense, true deity is naturally immortal and cannot literally experience death. This simple biblical truth found in 1 Timothy 6, 14 to 16, explains one of the reasons for the necessity of the incarnation of Christ. Here you can look at Hebrews 2, 9, and verses 14 to 18. Only dependent mortal human nature could be subject to death. And in the experience of the incarnation, Jesus took our human nature and died the death of Calvary. But once more, we pose the question, why was it that only one who is fully divine would be capable of offering the sacrifice of an atoning death? Why would this be true if Christ in his deity was incapable of a literal divine death? Why is it that Jesus is the only atonement maker? It appears that the answer has a number of fascinating facets. First of all, the very union of divinity with humanity and Christ incarnate nature suggests that though divinity did not literally die, note this, it as good as died in the following sense. Christ's deity, along with his humanity, self-sacrificially consented to Christ's human death at every step of the way to the cross. This, of course, was the great crisis of Gethsemane. This is why Christ was sweating blood, as it were, because it was there that he finally made the decision to beat the greatest of all temptations that Satan could offer. Give it up. Go back to heaven. Leave them to their devices. But Christ did not do that. And the great moment upon which salvation history turns is that the divine human Son of God in Gethsemane made the decision to go to Calvary and do it. In other words, Christ had to totally die to his most precious wishes, and that was to not be separated from the love of his merciful Heavenly Father. But he chose to move ahead to suffer the just love of God's atoning wrath. Christ's deity, along with his humanity, self-sacrificially consented to death at every step of the way to the cross. And in so doing, the very nature of Christ's human death became invested with the infinite value of eternal love. An illustration from the death of Abraham Lincoln might prove helpful. Abraham Lincoln was the great American president during the American Civil War, which was one of the most tragic wars fought ever in the history of humankind. From a purely personal point of view, Abraham Lincoln's death, soon after the Civil War was concluded, he was assassinated while attending a theatrical performance in Washington, D.C. with his wife. The death of Abraham Lincoln was probably one of the two or three greatest national tragedies in the history of the United States of America. From a purely human point of view, his death was no more tragic than that of any other murder victim. But from the perspective of his value to the nation, his death was a much greater tragedy. The value that had been invested in the life and character of President Lincoln by virtue of his office as president and his acts as the leader and the healer of the nation's wounds in the Civil War invested his death with much greater significance than that of any other ordinary citizen. And Christ, the one who was by divine nature endowed with the offices of creator and redeemer is the only being of sufficient value and virtue to offer an effectually saving sacrifice for sin. I like the way Ellen White has put it. 
From the book, The Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2, page 10, she says this, that the divine Son of God was the only sacrifice of sufficient value to fully satisfy the claims of God's perfect law. The angels were sinless, but note this, of less value to rescue man from his fallen condition. Note this from the book from Youth Instructor, June 21, 1900. Christ is equal with God, infinite and omnipotent. By the way, these are just powerful Trinitarian testimonies coming from the pen of the Adventist prophetess Ellen White. Christ could pay the ransom for man's freedom. He could say that which the highest angel could not say. I have power over my own life, power to lay it down, and power to take it again. You see what Ellen White is saying here? There is value in the death of Christ because of his infinite, inherent, life-giving power. He is life itself. He is the life giver, both of life in time and life in eternity. Now, one of the second major reasons why only one who is fully divine could redeem is this. Only a love that resided in a member of the Godhead was also capable of judging sin. And probably here's where the great power issue comes into play. It is the loving value of infinite divine loves that makes the cross redeeming. It is the power of God that makes the cross a judgment on sin. The fully divine love of Christ possessed not only innate value, but also power to conquer sin. And why is this so? A possible clue lies in the very nature of what sin is. Let me just try to talk this out rather quickly here. I'm going to suggest that what sin is, is it is classically unlove. You say, Dr. Whitten, that's kind of a crazy way to put it. No, it's not. Sin is everything that love divine is not. Sin is all about me first, you second. Human beings first, God, get out of the way. We want to live however we want to live. The very nature of godly righteousness is the manifestation of love. The law of God is a concrete expression of his nature of love. This is the great truth that Christ talked about in Matthew 22, 36 to 40. What Paul talks about in Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. What John in 1 John 5, 2 and 3 talks about. It defines in vivid commands the very way that beings filled with love divine will think and act. And that which goes contrary to God's express law acts contrary to the law of God. Thus sin is thinking and acting and not only an unlawful, but in an unloving manner. To put the issue another way, sin could come into existence only because of the very nature of God's love. The fact that God's love requires free choice makes it possible for sin to exist. That's crazy, isn't it? Are we saying that then God is responsible for sin? In one sense, you probably could say that. But let's be very careful here. It is Satan that is the author of sin, not God. But because God is love, it prepares the way for the possibility of unlove to thrust its awful character and nature into this God-created universe. The very God-given freedom essential to the exercise of love allows for sinful disobedience. Yet when sin takes advantage of God's love-born freedom and goes against his very nature, it can manifest itself only as the selfishly chosen attitudes and actions of everything that is unloving. Thus sin becomes the human creation that feeds off of God's love and becomes an intensely perverse twisting of love divine. Sin simply cannot exist without God's nature of love, but is a perversely parasitic revelation or development. Most certainly God is not in any sense sin's author. It is the mysterious, perverse brainchild of Satan and nothing can ever fully explain it. Just like love in its final analysis is mysteriously inexplicable 
so is sin and all of its fruition. But without God's granting the right to choose that which is contrary to his nature of love, there could have been no such thing as sin. Therefore, we can understand sin as that which is a totally the opposite of God's love. Therefore, only the knowledgeable power of divine love residing in Christ, in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9, only that power and that love has the power to unveil and judge its parasitic alter ego sin. The upshot of these facts is that the death of Christ on the cross was in principle the judgment and the defeat of sin which prepared the way for the salvation of the human race. Let's think about a couple of other important implications that are going on here. Christ's life and death reveal divine love in a way never before seen in the history of the universe. And it is such loving and merciful justice that reaches out in waves of spiritual and moral influence to give sinners repentance for sin. Such repentance is inspired not only by Christ revealing the enormity of sin, but also results from a deeper appreciation of God's offer of a mercy that we really don't deserve. So Jesus' revelation of love in his perfect life and atoning death is what changes our attitudes towards sin and God so that we are enabled to respond to his offer of mercy and new life. But the son's judgment of sin by his life and death demonstration of love enables God to do one more important act. And that is this. The perfect obedience of Christ to the law and his bearing the penalty of the broken law for us allows God to forgive repentant sinners. He grants forgiveness to repentant sinners for Christ's sake. That is, because of what God's love has secured in the life and death of Christ, God is able to secure our forgiveness by declaring that all that belongs to Christ is now accounted as ours if we receive it by faith. We are given new histories. Christ's life is now accounted as ours. We're given new legal standing and powerful motives of God's love to live like and for Him from henceforth. And for all of this, has, and all of this has been obtained on the basis of what the love of God has wrought out, not what some mere human creature has accomplished. The justifying merits of Christ are the manifestations of God's righteousness, not those of some creaturely being. This understanding of God's way of forgiveness and justifying grace is inextricably bound up with his divine love. Only the love that resides in the fully divine Christ could secure such a righteousness. Now what has proven interesting in all of this is that almost all groups who are unclear on justification by grace through faith alone and the forgiving grace of Christ are anti-Trinitarian. I won't name any names here, but we could have it in a personal conversation. And this includes early anti-Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventism. If you really want to get clear on salvation through Christ, by grace, through faith alone, I urge you to get serious about the implications of God's Trinitarian love. The benefits of Christ's full deity, however, do not end with the manifestation of justifying grace. His deity also guarantees a powerful experience of new life for the believer, both in time and in eternity. The new life from Christ includes conversion to a new life of love in time. Thus, his death not only cancels sin and destroys the power of death, but Christ's divine love enables us to be restored in our characters. We call this the great work of character restoration or sanctifying life-changing grace. 
Not only is the full deity of Christ absolutely essential to his offer of forgiving or justifying grace, but it also provides the power of transforming grace. When Paul says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, what he means is, is God's love so powerfully changes our attitudes that we now know that we want to live for Christ and can live for Christ through his power of transforming grace mediated to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the great creator, becomes the great physician of the human soul, ravaged by the raging infection of sin, flowing out of his righteous life and atoning death. His healing powers are so powerful that not one desperate soul need despair that he or she cannot be healed from any character defect. Possibly still another metaphor besides that of healing could also explain the issue of God's transforming grace, or put it simply, God's transforming divine love. That would be the metaphor of the comforting presence of a strong parent with a weak and fearful child. When I was a little boy, I was absolutely scared to death of the dark. But any time that I walked into the dark and my strong father was with me, I had no fear of the dark. When I would go on an errand at night, I would imagine all sorts of evil demons lurking about in the shadows, ready to pounce on me. But somehow, when I was with my daddy, those demons seemed powerless. When the mighty God, the powerful Jesus, is by our side in the struggle with the demonic forces of darkness, we need not fear. Furthermore, not only was the full deity of Christ necessary for him to forgive sin and transform our character, but his divine nature assures us that he's always there for us as our sustaining redeemer. That is, the divine Christ is constantly an available and effective advocate, intercessor, or mediator between humanity and God the Father. Yet the one who is divine is also himself the man. It is a concept that is beautifully expressed in the metaphor of the surety. This reassuring term projects the idea of a person who unceasingly stands for another, particularly in cases of debt. The guarantor will make sure that the debt will be paid if the one who has incurred it should fail to pay the debt. Bible-believing writers, and here especially Ellen White loves this term, Christ as our surety, Christ as our advocate with the Father. These Bible-believing writers have often used the wonderful description of Christ as the sinner's substitute and surety to picture him as our constantly interceding, mediating advocate before the Father. Yes, there is one who stands for us, whose plenitude of infinite love is in our favor. What a fully sufficient Savior that we have in Christ. Once more, Ellen White has expressed this theme in a way that closely resembles the classic 4th century A.D. Trinitarian Confessions. This is from the Review and Herald, December 22, 1891. The reconciliation of of man to God could be accomplished only through a mediator who was equal with God, possessed of attributes that would dignify and declare him worthy to treat with the infinite God in man's behalf and also represent God to a fallen world. Man's substitute and surety must have man's nature, a connection with the human family whom he was to represent. And as God's ambassador, he must partake of the divine nature, have a connection with the infinite, in order to manifest God to the world and be a mediator between God and sinful man. Again, this is from Ellen White, Review and Herald, December 22, 
1891. Is it any wonder that from the days especially of Athanasius in the fourth century up to the present time, that Trinitarian thought has been repeatedly the fountainhead of the exaltation of Christ as the only one who can redeem because he was fully human, had a full identity with us, and fully divine, filled with all the plenitude of redeeming power. Now one last matter as I close out here. Think of the implications of this for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. If we have been loved in such a powerful way, by such a self-sacrificing, loving, eternal Trinitarian God, especially at his manifest in the person of Christ, why then should we ever doubt our salvation status? And how is it that we can be treating one another in an unredemptive, unlike way in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Again, I give to you the great Trinitarian love of God as it has been manifest to us in the life and in the saving offices of Jesus Christ as mediated to us by the all-powerful Holy Spirit. Thank you.